Hello everyone, a very good morning to all of you. Greetings from Premier Brains. Uh, it gives us immense pleasure to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you joining with us today for our taxation webinar. We are really happy to have you with us. So before we start the session, uh, let me speak a few words about Premier Brains. We are Premier Brains firm founded in Dubai over 12 years ago with extensive experience in handling audit and assurance, accounting, taxation, business consultancy and advisory. We are headquartered in Dubai with offices at Abu Dhabi and Sharjah. We have our international presence in Kuwait, Oman and very soon we shall establish our office in Saudi Arabia as well. We are also part of the global network of Audit Trust International, which spans in more than 115 countries. We are also we are approved FTA agents and are listed with major banks and free zones. So uh, let me introduce our speakers for today. We have uh, Rishi Chavla, a fellow chartered accountant and MBA graduate with over 18 years of experience. Rishi is the managing partner with Premier Brains and is associated since the year 2011. And his previous experience includes working with big four firms like ENY and Deloitte. We also have uh, Sanjay Gagrani, fellow chartered accountant and partner with Premier Brains. He has over 25 years of diverse industry experience from oil and gas to hospitality. Sanjay's expertise spans India, Maldives and UAE. So with Rishi and Sanjay leading the way, let us get ready for an engaging, engaging session of CT registration timelines and latest updates on Pillar 2. So without further ado, let's dive right into the heart of our discussion with Sanjay. Uh, thank you very much, Darshini, and happy morning to each and everyone who has joined today this exciting webinar. Uh, uh, first of all, happy Ramadan to all of you who are uh, having the fast and uh, following the Ramadan period. I hope you all are doing well and can see the presentation clearly and hear me loud and clear. In UAE, we have already embarked a journey where the tax and compliance navigate. We are evolving in the in the landscape of tax and compliance. That's make a significant steps where the economy of the UAE moving from a zero tax to the structured tax economy. The shift began in 2018 when the, the UAE has introduced the VAT law, following up then later on the economic substance requirement, and uh, recently in 2022. Uh, UAE government has announced uh, and took a monumental step uh, announcing the corporate tax, which went into effective from 1st June 2023. Since the law was announced, there were a series of ministerial decisions, cabinet decisions, uh, guidelines, and a lot of material came out, which is, uh, and we are actually the fortunate enough who are witnessing the, a country transitioning from uh, zero tax to the tax structure economy is a major shift uh, and uh, and we are really fortunate to experience it firsthand. So exactly on the, just one month back on 27th Feb, uh, the FTA has again uh, surprised most of the finance and tax professional when they have issued a comprehensive guidelines which provide the, the timeline to apply for corporate tax registration for all types of the taxpayer in UAE. Uh, the timelines they have indicated for the, whether it's a resident taxpayer, non-resident, or individual person who is carrying out the business activity in UAE. We'll discuss this all in detail. But in this webinar, I will cover who needs to register the corporate tax, uh, what are the different timelines, uh, with the help of the different example, plus if we don't comply, so what are the panel provisions? Later on, my partner, my colleague, CLC Chawla, will cover uh, the on pillar two requirement, a discussion paper which is already in out. Uh, as we deep dive into, please remember, uh, the chat box is open. You can post all your questions and queries. We'll I provide you all comprehensive answer at the end of session. So without further ado, so let me, uh, what I structure in my presentation is, first is I will, uh, talk about who are required to get registered under the UAE corporate tax law. 
and later on we discuss about a different timeline and the penal provisions. So let's move on. So the as per FTA decision, there are three. I have uh, divided this uh, all the category in the three major categories. Uh, one is the resident judicial person, another is the non-resident, and the natural person. So within the resident judicial person, as we know, as per the UA corporate tax law guidelines or definition, um, mostly this is first is the all the entities those who has incorporated, registered, got a license in the UAE. Okay, and the second would be the any foreign entity, uh, those are uh, effectively managed from UAE, uh, also considered as a, if it is considered as a resident judicial person, they also require to get registered. When we talk about the non-resident judicial person, that uh, as per the law, uh, there are two different of the non-resident judicial person as of now. One who has a permanent establishment in the state, and second is one who has nexus in the UAE. Third, we talk about we'll talk about our natural person who is conducting business activity in UAE, whether resident or non-resident, and uh, whose turnover is exceed the specified limit of one million dirham. So, as the this uh, uh, deadline came on, out on 27th Feb and went effective from 1st March, so that uh, uh, the entire this deadline is also divided into two different segments. Uh, for the all categories, one, the can companies uh, establishment businesses is already in existence as on 1st March 2024. For them, there is a different guidelines, a different timelines, and those who are going to be in the future, uh, who, who are going to register in the future company, future registered entities which would like to come new way and start a business, there are different timelines are given. So let's talk about the companies who are resident judicial person, including free zone, irrespective of the designated free zone or non-designated free zone. It's very clear cut that all the companies who have uh, businesses license here, they need to apply for the corporate tax registration as per the table given the sl slides. I must reiterate again, this deadline is for the application. Uh, what it does mean is, even if you apply well within the deadline, but your application does not get approved, we are fine. FTA may take some time for your approval for tax registration. So giving you the example here, if uh, any entity here, if any entity, let's say, uh, they have, uh, in, let's say in the, my example here is Tech Innovation LLC, a mainland entity, uh, they need to apply for the registration for corporate tax, let's say by 30th June, if it is established or license issued in the month of March 2022. This is in line with the very plain vanilla table is given in the FTA decision, which uh, we can analyze based on the license issued. Keep in mind that the year of the license issue is irrelevant. We need to assess when was the, in which month the license was issued. In case of any entity where they don't have the license, but they have the place of active management as on 1st March 2024, they need to apply by within a three months period. Uh, in my second example, as mentioned here is, let's say Global Venture Limited, a US entity, but is having a place of active management in the UAE, then it must apply for registration for corporate tax within three months. If we calculate for three months from the 1st March, which means we need to apply for corporate tax registration by 31st May 2024. Now, the resident judicial person, which are uh, uh, including free zone, those going to be established or recognized after March 2024, for them, there is a deadline, a separate timeline is given for the application. Uh, if any company who wish to establish any business in UAE, including free zone, they need to apply for corporate tax registration within three months from the date of incorporation or date of establishment, once the day, date of the license issue. I'm giving you an example here again, uh, let's say the Eco Solution Fusion Company established somewhere in the 5th April 2024. So they need to apply for a corporate registration within three months. In this case, they need to apply with three months' time is by 5th July or by, you can say, conservatively by 30th June 2024. Uh, keeping the example again, the resident judicial person, but on or after 1st March 2024. 
Uh, this is the example where they need foreign entity, but uh, they place effective management uh, established post 1st March 2024. Uh, let me just go a little bit in detail. What does it mean is, let's say local Amirati uh, established a company in uh, Singapore, but it's a place effective management uh, established somewhere, let's say in the now, 27th March is going to start the company with Singapore uh, and he get registration right on 27th March uh, and that is uh, place effective management in UAE. So that Singapore entity needs to be registered as per UAE corporate tax law within three months from the end of the person's financial years. So in this particular case, if the place effective management of any foreign entity based out in UAE, uh, they need to apply for the corporate tax registration from uh, end the three months from the end of the person's financial years. Uh, if the Singapore entity is following the calendar is a, is a financial year, you need to apply uh, by 31st March 2025 in this example. So here I took the example of the help of the Global Venture Limited shifting its place of effective management to Abu Dhabi in May 2024. Following the calendar year, again, as I mentioned, the financial year, they need to apply for corporate registration within three months from the end of the financial year. As I mentioned, uh, three months from the end of the financial years. So these are uh, we already covered our resident judicial person. And next topic is about non-resident judicial person. So non-resident judicial person uh, on or before first March 2024. So there are two categories as we discussed initially in the first slide. The first is the person who has a permanent establishment in the country. Uh, if any not not resident, they have a permanent establishment in the country, so they need to apply uh, for corporate tax registration within nine months from the date of starting the PE in UAE. Uh, there is still a bit of clarity is required that we'll discuss later on when we have the question and answer session. So in this case, I take an example. Let's say in the a German entity construction GmbH with the Dubai office is 2019. Uh, they are following the calendar year is January, December as a financial year. So they need to ensure this corporate tax registration is completed by September 2024. The next is the non-resident person. The second category of non-resident judicial person is the person who has access in UAE. Uh, I think uh, we already have a separate uh, notification about the what the nexus mean. Uh, for any non-resident company which has immovable property in UAE and they are earning an income, so that will be considered as a they have an access in, in UAE. We're giving you a practical example, uh, and they are only required to register within three months from the March 1st, 2024. So example here is the now the financial advisor incorporation. Uh, assuming this company you know, is an Indian company generating significant UA income from real estate properties since 2019. So they also required to register for corporate tax by 31st May, following the guidelines for non-resident before March 2024. Now the non-resident again, the uh, category is the non-resident, uh, they are going to be on or after March 1st, 2024. So deadline is again here, they have given us some different timeline for registration, for application of registration here. Uh, again, again, we talk about here the company who has permanent establishment in country, uh, but that established only after 1st March. So here time period, what they have given is a six months from the date of starting the PE in the UAE. Uh, again, uh, the example I've given here, Agri-Tech Corporation set up in Abu Dhabi Tech Park in 30th June 2024. Uh, this is the foreign entity where they have permanent establishment was uh, 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 established in the turn in somewhere in June 34. So they must register within six months from the establishment. So in this case, they need to apply for the corporate tax registration well within the 31st December 2024. The non-resident person, a second category about the nexus post 1st March 2024. Here timeline is three months from the date of establishment of relationship. Uh, as we discussed, the nexus is all about if any foreign entity, they have the significant income from the real estate property in UAE, that would be considered that they have nexus in UAE. 
if any company which is start, uh, I mean, they acquire any property in UAE post 1st March 2024, so they need to apply for corporate tax registration moment they, uh, their nexus is established in UAE. Uh, in my example here, again, I have taken a retail giant PLC, uh, assuming it's the Singaporean entity starting earning rental income from immobile property from 1st July 2024. So must complete its situation within three months from initial rental income. In this case, yeah, yeah. so when the movement is start generating the income, so they need to apply for corporate registration within next three months. In our example, if they start getting rental income for 1st July, so they need to apply for by 30th September 2024. The last category is about a natural person who is conducting business activity or business in UAE. And for them, again, that we'll discuss about two different categories. One is about the resident, a uh, resident person who is carrying out any business activity in UAE uh, and any calendar year which exceed the specified limit, which is 1 million. So they need to apply the, with the next three months, or in our case, it is if it is a following the calendar year. So by 31st March, uh, for uh, they need to apply for the corporate tax registration. So here, Mr. Ali Al Masuri find is earning again exceeding the threshold of 1 million and they are uh, they're running the business activity which require the license for the December 2024. He must register for corporate tax by 31st March 2025. In case of the natural person, but a non resident, uh, uh, the fulfill of the amount for the requirement for registration is again three months. From the date the year, uh, the person is start getting an earning here in the UAE. Uh, in the, my case, I've taken a US citizen, John Smith. Uh, he exceeded the CT turnover threshold while working remotely for UAE firm in 2024. So John needs to register for corporate tax within three months from exceeding the threshold. If exceeded in 31 December 2024, the registration need to be applied by 31st March 2025. So this is a summary of the what we just discussed. Uh, so what I analyze uh, when I when you analyze this entire summary about corporate tax registration deadline. So what is coming out of it? Uh, the first of all for the all the UA entity, those who are already have position as established entities, those who already have the position as of first March 2024, they need to apply based on the license uh, issued month, and and they have maintained it because they don't want to. They have given a very uh, phase manner application requirement is not mean to have the proper and smooth registration process and to avoid ad, uh, any admin or technical glitches there. Based on this summary, if you can make out that most of the places requirement is within three months, either three months for establishment of the new entity or three months from the end of the financial years or three months from the establishment of the relationship, except in the case of PE. Uh, most of the time, if you already have the PE as of 1st March 2024, the entity is required to register within nine months. Uh, what if there are any non resident, they are going to have uh, like PE in the future period, they need to apply for the six months on the date of starting the PE. So, and in a nutshell, uh, if there are any UAE entity, I mean, that's the most of the cases of uh, we have like a lot of UAE entity here that will be around 80% of our total taxpayer going to be. Uh, they need to apply for registration based on the month of the license issued. And rest of the entity that uh, they need to follow the different timeline as we discussed. The penalty. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this timeline, what we just discussed is all about the, your application process. If we don't file the application while well within that deadline, then they, uh, we're going to get a trade the penalty of 10,000 dirham. This is as per FTA. Uh, uh, cabinet decision number 75, which was issued earlier. So this is from me about uh, the uh, only for the timelines and the uh, next session will be taken up by my partner Rishi Chavla. And whatever questions you have about this timeline for registration, please drop a message. We'll take up all the queries and uh, give you the comprehensive answer towards the end of the session. And uh, over to you, Rishi.
Um, right. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, uh, for such a engaging discussion, and I'm, I'm sure your examples and, and the way you've explained must have been valuable. So thank you very much for the same. Um, right. I just uh, asked for the control of the screen. Yeah, no, I yes, think sir. I have it. All right, OK. So before I start on this uh, topic, let me just uh, say it very quickly that um, this is not a very like a common kind of a topic which you see. So this this particular topic has a lot of concepts which are new. If you haven't read it before, you might find areas which are sounding a bit complicated uh, and confusing. But uh, don't mind what I'm trying to do is I'm using few examples during this um, presentation wherein you can get some knowledge about it, but there will be some concept which will sound a little confusing because these are different concepts than your normal taxations. And uh, so so please bear with me. And uh, in case you get confused at some point, you can always reach out to us at a later stage and we will definitely help you with with any questions on that matter. So with that, I'll start on the presentation. So very recently, basically Ministry of um, uh, Ministry of Finance has issued this uh, guidance paper on the Pillar 2. Uh, so Pillar 2 is nothing but coming out of the OECD guidelines, and this, this is already there for some time. So let's dive into it a bit. So I'll give you a little bit of background about what it is, where it has come, and, and then we'll, we'll at the same time going to go a bit deep into what uh, the consultative consultation paper, which is issued by Ministry of Finance, is talking about. Right. So what is exactly? So basically, uh, Pillar 2 is nothing but it cover, covers the base erosion and profit shifting concept. What it means is that you see a lot of large multinational companies. Uh, they always uh, you know, kind of restructure their businesses by moving the head offices or subsidiaries into different locations. And one of the primary, primary, uh, primarily reason is, um, is, is to avoid paying higher taxes and this is what uh, this particular topic is trying to um, find an answer to and to ensure that uh, these large multinational companies at least pay some minimum tax which is the pillar 2 tax of 15 percent so that it is all about and then so as, as I just said that countries and you know that a lot of large um, uh, or developed countries depends a lot on the tax collection. So if they are not getting paid properly by the large multinationals, so it, it affects the GDP, it affects the country's growth, a lot of factors. So at some, some stage it was expected to come and which is here. And overall, uh, by view of this base erosion profit shifting, it is expected that over 100 to 240 billion US dollars is lost in tax revenue globally. So which is a very large number. So this is what this pillar two is trying to cover. So here is, uh, is one example I just put uh, in front of you is that the average corporate tax in US, for example, is 21%, but you can see all the large companies here and see what effective rate they're paying. Like Amazon, they, it, though it's a US based company, but the effective of what, what you said effective means the average tax they are paying is around 6% because of you know a lot of structuring all around the globe. So these are some of the uh, major reasons why this particular pillar two has been enacted uh, and has come into practice. I mean, this is I think very it's a very new tax which is um, coming into countries, a lot of countries across the globe. Um, but it will basically uh, pick up pace in the in the coming years. That's that's what the OECD guidelines and that's what uh, G20 meetings are all talking about these days about this particular pillar to um, globe tax. So let me tell you some facts about it. Um, the idea of this particular um, tax is that it it's trying to uh, tax where the actual economic activity is conducted conducted so that is one thing secondly it is also trying to handle any kind of tax disputes on international taxation which are coming so that's another idea behind bringing this tax um now 
the next question comes like like for example this pillar 2 is there but it's not one country tax right it is a global tax so how do you ensure that countries across the globe actually uh, apply this tax so for that the answer is there is something called an inclusive framework if, if you can see here uh, this is basically uh, means that in the inclusive framework whichever countries are accepting or being a, becoming part of that inclusive framework they are supposed to apply pillar 2 in that in their country so overall right now about around 130 countries around the globe are part of the inclusive framework and you can very well see that UAE, India, Bahrain, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman, which is the countries nearby are already part of the inclusive framework. So if we, like UAE as, is starting now, but at some stage it will show up in the other countries also. Right. And then another thing is that uh, the OECD and G20 basically monitors this inclusive framework and there is a report issued to the G20 meetings. Uh, which happens every year on the progress of this pillar to implementation. So UAE joined this pillar two on 16th of May 2018, and this is one of the reasons why we had CBCR country by country reporting uh, implemented in UAE. So this is just to give you a little bit of snapshot of what is BAPS. 2.0 covers. So I'm going to cover in this presentation only on the pillar two, basically, which is the consultation document issued by the Ministry of Finance in UAE. So I'm not going to cover pillar two, but let me still at least show you that when we say BAPS, it has two pillars. When we say pillar two, there should be a pillar one, right? That's why I've included this particular slide here. So pillar two, pillar one basically is not bringing any new text. It's the idea of the pillar one is basically um, balancing the tax paid by large, large multinational, very large multinational. So large multi multinational means having uh, global turnover more than 20 billion euros. So those kind of uh, companies, the, the, the profits which they earn has to be spread out across uh, the other country. That is the idea behind like, so there's amount A which talks about this. Then there is amount V which talks about the transfer pricing rules with the large multinational. And the third one talks about, uh, you know, taxing the company who are operating without physical presence. So you know that because of digitization, companies can operate, especially the e-commerce uh, related platform. They don't really need to be present in particular country with the offices and the staff and things of that nature. They can very well operate from anywhere and still uh, you know, earn a, a good amount of income from a country. So these are some of the areas which Pillar 1 talks about. We are not going to cover that. So Pillar 2 is the global minimum tax. So this is what actually leads to a new additional tax and is on which we have this uh, consultation document issued by Ministry of Finance. Right. Sorry, right. OK, so so pillar two facts, as I said that. Um, this is basically a to jurisdictions engaged in tax competition, so you you I'm sure you must have read that all this uh, a lot of countries. Uh, advertise a lot zero tax or low tax, that kind of thing. So what it means is that uh, the large uh, large multinationals they they shift their subsidiaries or or their operating model in some way so that they pay a very low tax so this particular pillar 2 is trying to cover against that secondly i already mentioned that uh, growth of intangibles um, like copyrights brand patents so these are some of the models which are used by a lot of companies in order to shift their profit this is also something which uh, this particular um, uh, tax is is going to cover the pillar 2 basically and um, the, the pillar two is designed to ensure that large internationally operating businesses pay at least at least 15 percent tax regardless of location. So as I uh, showed you in the, the slide uh, earlier, like the average corporate tax is 21 percent in US. However, the large company which actually started their business 
in US are paying much lower effective tax rate in US. Uh, so uh, or not US, globally, the effective tax rate they're paying is, is much lower than the tax the tax rate which is there in the company in which they incorporated or where they are earning most of their revenue so so this particular pillar two is trying to catch up all these large multinationals uh, so that to ensure that they at least pay 15 percent tax on their global profits uh, so that uh, there is a fair competition for other uh, other kind of companies which are coming up which are paying high tax uh, and 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 not able to generate that much cash profits as these companies are able to do. So right. So so what it talks about is uh, it talks about effective tax rate. So effective tax rate. We will have some slide on this, but very briefly on on the uh, the high level. It it means is uh, when you look at the total tax. If you look at your consolidated financials and you look at the tax which you are paying divided by the revenue which you are doing. So what percentage? tax you are paying that's called effective tax rate so so what it tries to see is that you at least the, those large multinational companies should pay at least 15 percent effective tax rate so how it's going to charge it basically what it means is that the the comp the it, there are two the basically two main concepts in this one is about irr and utpr we'll talk about this in the next slide so just on this is basically what they look at is they look at the global revenue uh, where the parent ultimate parent company is sitting right so they look at the effective tax rate uh, which that that particular company or the the global operations are paying and any shortfall is paid through the top up tax so we have examples on this we'll cover in the coming slides uh, so as i just said that another important point which you need to understand here it it applies to only multinational enterprises so multinational means companies having operation in more than one country is a multinational enterprise. So I have some questions also later during the session, which will try to test you how how uh, how closely you're uh, listening to me. So at least your knowledge is properly, uh, you know, there uh, with respect to this concept. OK, so this applies to multinational enterprises and it applies to only those multinational enterprises whose global Revenue, gross revenue, consolidated one is 750 million euros or above. Okay, so very important that only to multinational enterprises and secondly, consolidated group revenue of more than 750 million euros, right? And uh, when we calculate this uh, revenue, we look at at least two, uh, we look at last four financial years and out of those four financial years, at least two financial years should have this much revenue in order to qualify uh, as a pillar to um, company, right? So this is important to understand. And there are some exclusion like government entity, not profit organization, international uh, uh, as organization. There's a lot of, uh, lot of what you call data on this. If you go to OECD guidelines, pillar two, I'm sure, uh, you know, you will be submerged with data. It's so much information out there. I trust me when I was studying, I spent like two weeks just to find out how, how do I get to the, you know, the meat of the problem. Uh, it's, 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 it's been debated a lot. So, but you can get more information if you like to um, on the OECD um, website. Right, so let, let's give you, let's uh, just, let's look at a little more simply. So what are global minimum tax trying to do? So for example, imagine a scenario here, a country A, which has a tax rate of 25%. So what usually happen is you have revenue of 1000, reduce the expenses, say profit of 400, you apply 25%, you pay tax of 100 and clear, no problem with this, right? Now we look at the example number two. Scenario two. Now, say for example, if a multinational enterprise they see that there is a country B which has an effective corporate tax rate of only five percent. However, in the parent they are paying twenty five percent as the taxes. So what they can very easily do is create a royalty agreement. They open a new entity in country B, create a royalty agreement between country A and country B. So what happens is you can see this red two two fifty is paid out as royalty. Uh, charges from uh, country A to country B. So this brings the profit down, the tax down. And country B, they pay, okay, fine, they pay 5% corporate tax in country B, but overall the tax comes down. Let's look at the next page. Now you can see in scenario one, 
they were paying $100 as the tax. But in scenario two, because of shifting uh, the profit through royalty, uh, the effective tax rate or what they are paid is only $1.50. This is what pillar two is trying to uh, cover, right? So because of these practices, there's 100 to 240 billion US dollar in lost tax revenue every year, which which is like four to ten percent of global corporate income tax revenue. So you can imagine uh, this is huge, really, really huge. All right, so let's dive into a little bit of complex subject. Now you have to pay attention in this because here from where the concepts are now coming. Now, so far we were discussing about the basics. Now, how how does this work is what we are trying to do in slides from here on. So there's something called a globe. So globe is says global anti-base erosion rules. And there is another su subject called subject to tax rule. So uh, the consultation document, which is issued by Ministry of Finance, is basically covering the globe, global anti-base erosion rules only. The subject to tax rule, which is basically more connected with the tax treaties between the countries, that is not been handled at the moment in the consultation document. So we have to wait for more information that comes out in future. So, so we'll focus on global anti-base erosion rules, which is basically the part of the guideline which is issued. So it talks about two things. Uh, uh, one is the income inclusion rule. So what it is, how it works, we have example in the next slide. So wait for that. Second is UTPR, under tax payment rule, which also we have an example in the next page. And then we there's something called a domestic minimum tax up, uh, top up rate. So it what it means is that like, for example, you can see in UAE now we have 9% uh, as the corporate tax in, in UAE, but at the same time, the consultation talk, document is talking, up, talking about 15% on large multinational enterprises. So this is nothing but a domestic minimum top up tax, which has been built on the multinational enterprises. So, uh, so, so, so it talks about that. And there's another cost concept of switch over rule, which is not covered by the consultation document. So I'll skip that also for, for the moment. What is what is important you have to listen here is there are two important things which you have to pay attention, which is one is income inclusion rule and second is the under tax payment rule, which is UTPR. So IRR and UTPR, these are two important uh, rules you have to focus. And secondly, the the these do these not necessarily these both apply at the same time. Usually income inclusion rule is the first first one which applies. And in cases there is no IRR or income inclusion rule, then you go to the UTPR under tax payment rule. So this is something you, you have to keep in mind. So now how does this top of tax is calculated? So there's a process laid out uh, in the um, consultation document. So these are just the steps. So how does it work is the starting point is First is to identify a multinational enterprise. So how do you identify a multinational enterprise? So company with company with global revenue, like audited financial, you look at if your audited financial, consolidated audited financial of your entity has 750 million euro or above uh, revenue, that, that you become a multinational enterprises, right? And secondly, then you look at the constituent entities. So CE means constituent entity. So constituent entity means if you are the parent, uh, in UAE, so all entities or subsidiaries which are down the line are the constituent entities. So what you have to do is first of all identify the multinational enterprise where the head office is, where the parent is, and then you go and identify the constituent entity and on in which jurisdictions are those constituent entities are incorporated. So those subsidiaries in say which place in Europe, Africa, whichever place, you have to look at the each jurisdiction basis. That's very, very important. So when you're doing this calculation of top up tax. You don't do it at just an average like this. You have to go every jurisdiction wise. So why this is there's a very important reason why this is because see global in uh, global minimum tax of 15% uh, which is discussed in the pillar two. Right, one of the logic is that the the profits at least should be taxed at 15%. It does not talk about that the tax should be at 15%. Hear me out here. It talks about the minimum global tax, not the tax, right? So the minimum should be 15%, but it can be more. 
what it trying to the effective tax rate can be more so for example in in us the tax rate is say around 21 percent and say so uae for example if we have not implemented this pillar two the tax rate is nine percent so so even if you, on an average you come to 15 percent that that's not what it's trying to achieve so if us is paying 21 percent let them pay 21 percent but the revenue or the profits of uae should at least be up to 15 percent that's what you have to understand that's an important concept in IRR or UTPR in the pillar two, right? So you identify a multinational enterprise and identify the subsidiaries under the parent to know the overall uh, scope uh, for applying this top of tax. Then you determine the globe income. So if globe income, there is a how you calculate globe income. There is a little bit of a concept on that, which we'll cover up later on the in the slide. So just look at basically for every subsidiary you have to find out what is the income what is the profits they are earning for every entity right then you look at what is the taxes these subsidiaries or the constituent entities are paying so how much so you what it is trying to do is you have to calculate the average tax for every entity every uh, every subsidiary jurisdiction wise so you have to basically split all the constituent entities jurisdiction wise and see what is that average tax rate you are paying for every constituent entities and based on that you calculate the effective tax rate what they are paying so if there is any shortfall from 15 percent that is what the top of tax is so for example uh, in uae if the tax rate is nine percent and we don't apply pillar two here so the effective tax rate in that case will be 15 percent so uh, six percent has to become our top of tax if there is no pillar two in uae so we have examples on this i just wanted to uh, clarify here more on this slide. All right, OK, so so pillar two, as I said, there are three things important. So STTR, which is more related to your uh, what you call treaty based rules. So we are not going to cover this. It's not in part of uh, uh, your um, guidance document issued by Ministry of Finance as well. So let's skip it for now. The second one is the income inclusion rule. And the, uh, the third one is the under tax payment rule. These are the, the two concepts. So we'll talk about it in the next few slides. So again, just to refresh our memories again, it talks about multinational enterprises and its constituent entities. So when we say constitute entities are the, basically the subsidiaries uh, which are below the multinational. So multinational enterprise means a company which has operation in more than one country should have consolidated group, group revenue more than euro 750 million or above to qualify for this pillar two rules. Right, so one first um, let's talk about IR. So we have examples on these two particular topic in the next few slides, but let's just look at it what it is talking about, right? So how does IRR work, income inclusion rule? How does it work? Basically, it starts from the parent. So basically, you have to first identify. So, where, so the, the most important point you have to understand is whenever you applying the globe rules, these rules can only be applied in the countries who are part of the inclusive framework. I already discussed at the beginning that there are about 130 plus countries which are part of um, the inclusive framework. Uh, so those countries only will apply the global rules. So if there is, there can be few countries in between your setup of multinational enterprise, which are not part of your uh, inclusive framework, they are not the countries you have to apply these rules. So that is something also you have to pay attention to. So when we talk about income inclusion rule, it start about, start from identify your parent so that parent has to be in in an inclusive framework country so if you have a situation where the parent is actually lying in a country which is not part of inclusive framework then you you go to the next uh, letter basically then you move down and see which is the next subsidiary which is which is part of an inclusive framework then you apply income inclusion rule in that that company right so we have example on this later on so basically income inclusion rule you basically apply at the parent level okay and basically the idea is to uh, uh, tax the low tax constituent entities so at least minimum at the jurisdiction level they should pay at least minimum 15 percent tax right so that is irr then utpr is basically it is very simple that where you don't have income inclusion rule, where there is no parent, for example, in a, a situation that 
uh, the, your parent is sitting in a country which is not part of the inclusive framework. So what happens next? There's nothing can be done. So you have all single subsidiaries in the uh, rest of the uh, inclusive framework countries, but the parent is not there. So you can't apply ERR. So then you go to UTPR. So basically what it says then uh, this these other countries, they have the possibility if they can see the parent is not getting uh, tax or there is no possibility to tax there, then the UTPR is applied at that those subsidiaries uh, level or those constituent entities basically by way of denying certain deductions. So basically, for example, if you are you have, say, for example, cost of sales of, say, 50 and there is a tax difference of 10 is coming. So you try to basically negate uh, such amount of expense so that you end up paying that 10, which is missing. So that's the idea behind uh, UTPR, right? All right, so let's look at uh, what uh, the top of tax. How does it work? Um, so now in this scenario, you can see there are three companies in this. Uh, there's a company, which is the ultimate parent company. So as I mentioned earlier, the top of tax starts at the parent level. And then the second uh, the second in line is B company in this. So again, it's a parent of C company. So basically the structure is like A company owns B company, B company owns C company, right? So now you can see uh, the profit before tax is 100 here the the tax rate in that particular jurisdiction so these are these come these countries uh, are sorry these companies are in different jurisdictions as well so you can see the corporate tax rate is 15 percent in company a the corporate tax rate in com in country b is 19 percent and in country is zero percent now what happens how do you ensure that the global minimum tax of 15 percent is paid by company c this is something where the issue is. So by way of restructuring the multinational, very clearly you can see it's it's a it's a no brainer. Basically, you know the tax rate is zero percent in company C. You can structure a business in such a way that you move your revenue through proper. You can create substance. Uh, you can create like a small office. You can put employees. You can do everything. So substance requirements which are there in the corporate tax, or for example in the CBCR or the ESR rules, is is again doable for the large multinationals. They can put some expense there, but end up saving the tax overall, right? So so in these situations is where what this top up tax is, is trying to cover. So what happened in this case is, now you can see at the bottom, uh, if you look at just purely, um, uh, just purely um, as a case without uh, applying a top up tax under GLOBE rules, so company A pay 15, say 15% on 100, company B pay 19, which is 19% on 100, and company C pays zero because there is no corporate tax in that country. So for example, Bahrain right now has no corporate tax. So, so there can be cases very easily where there is no, no corporate tax and uh, and and you can sh you can move your business, part of the business from, from a high tax country to a low tax country and restructure in such a way, especially if you are into global operations, to uh, you know, kind of minimizing your tax burden, right? So with the inclusion of top of tax, what happens is that company A automatically applies. So the parent, the ultimate first parent, has to first of all apply the inclusion rule. So if they are part of the inclusive framework, very important, they are part of the inclusive framework. Only then they, they can apply. So so then they apply the um, the fifteen percent on the C's profit. So what happens is you can see at the bottom the company A now now collects 15 per 15 is equal to 13. B company continues to pay 19, and C company since there is no tax in C company, it's zero. So so what it also means is that when you have ultimate parent company at the top level, it goes to jurisdiction level in order to calculate uh, the the corporate tax which has to be paid. What is important to understand is that there can be some countries which are not part of the inclusive framework or not there, but but still, at the parent level, the effective tax rate has to be mini has to be maintained. That is one of the objectives of this pillar too. So even if you are one of your entity goes to a non-inclusive framework country and operates from there as a subsidiary, uh, at the parent level, it will still come into the purview because a jurisdiction level review will still be taken up by the ultimate parent company. So this is clear. Let's look at another example, uh, which actually also tells us a little bit about why 
uh, UAE has two taxes now. Why? Why we have nine percent and we have fifteen percent. This this particular example also um, uh, gives you some logical reason behind this. Why it is it was expected to come and which is very much here, right? So imagine a situation here where company A is not part of inclusive framework for for argument sake. Okay, so so there is no IRR implemented in company A. So what happens next? So how do you apply the tax top of tax? So then it, as I said earlier, then it moves to the next entity. So now B company is the one responsible to apply the top of tax. So now B, so now you can same everything is same. What you can see here is now the A companies continues to basically pay 15%. Now company B will make a top up on company C. So that 19 plus 15, 34 goes to company B. So ultimately on overall, you can see the corporate tax rate is paid. Uh, the corporate tax is paid uh, for the whole global uh, profit. So you can see out of the 300 uh, profit, uh, 49 uh, is paid, which is more than 15% if you average it out. But what it means is that every jurisdiction level, the 15% is maintained. So I, I, this is a very, very important point to note. So why now, why we have you, we have 9% corporate tax in UAE and now we have pillar two talks about 15% of uh, global minimum tax. Reason is that just looking at this example, you can imagine that if UAE does not implement the 15%, what it means is the ultimate. So if there are any subsidiaries sitting in UAE, which are earning good profits in UAE and UAE does not charge them the global minimum tax or do not increase the tax rate on such multinational companies to 15 they will they will anyway pay 15 if not here in the parent company at ultimate parent at some stage so there is actually no tax loss as such uh, uh, for or the company or there is no tax gain or anything any ch anything changes for the multinational enterprise they have to pay that for 15 percent minimum at some stage somewhere uh, somewhere in some country, right? Because the 15% rule applies at every country level. So if UA does not increase from 9 to 15%, anyway, that uh, that subsidiary sitting in UAE will will pay that 15 at in some other parent company. So why to let the tax be, you know, taken by another country? Let that tax be paid by uh, that constituted entity in UA. So. So it does not create a new tax as such for the subsidiary, but it it ensures that since the country where they are actually doing the economic operation, they are generating the profit, they are generating the income out of UA. So UA should get a fair a fair share of such a tax. That's how that's the reason why the nine percent is for all the other entities. For multinational enterprises, we have fifteen percent as a global minimum tax. I hope uh, that clarifies the the logic behind why we have this. So let's go to the next slide. I'm just keeping an eye on the time as well. Um, so the next one is under text uh, profit rule. So let's look at what are the steps involved in this. Sorry. Okay, so, so UTPR or the under profit rule, as I mentioned uh, earlier, applies when there is no IR applied. So there is a possibility that the ultimate parent company, you know, the intelligence uh, of human beings cannot be imagined. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you agree to that. So so when you know that inclusive framework countries are there and there are a lot of countries which are not part of inclusive framework with a low tax or zero tax or anything of that nature, you can very easily push your parent companies to such places where there is no tax, no inclusive framework issues. and Again, you skip the IRR. So what happened in the, that case? So there is another option which is given, which is UTPR, which is under tax profit rule. So where there is no IRR applied, the next rule you go and apply is the UTPR. Normally, uh, where there is IR, there is no UTPR, but there can be there can be chances where both are applied. Also, we have to still see an example of that nature. Uh, but UTPR only comes as a secondary uh, method. So first, always starts with the IRR, right? So as I said, the IRR and UTPR might, might not apply at the same time. They are just two different methods to collect the top of tech. The idea is to collect that 15, the gap between 15 and say, for example, 15 and 9%. The idea is to how to cover that gap. That's the idea 
of these taxes at the jurisdiction level. So global minimum tax is at jurisdiction level. Very important to understand this, right? So there are two potential approaches in uh, UTPR, which is mentioned. One is denial of corporate tax deduction. As I mentioned earlier, that you actually deny a part of the the uh, corporate tax deduction. So wherein your average tax actually increases higher. That's option number one. The second option is introduce a new charge. You can very well look at a new charge to put it into uh, uh, the the scenario. So wherein the average tax rate increases a little bit higher. So I just want to also mention here that if you have any particular questions or you're getting confused on any particular point, please drop uh, those questions in the Q&A or the chat window. We'll try to cover it at the end of the session. Uh, because these are some new concepts. I'm sure you must be thinking a bit more about it and still might have just skipped when I was discussing it because these are some new concepts. So feel free to drop your questions and happy to take up if the time permits at the end of this session. Right. So let's look at the example of UTPR. How does it work? So as I mentioned, the first stage you have to always see whether the IRR or income inclusion rule is implemented or not. So now in this example, same scenario, not, nothing changes. Only thing is that in company A, there is no IRR implemented. Maybe it's not part of the inclusive framework. So there is no top of tax on the IRR. Then what other options company B has? So one option was that the company B can very well apply the IRR at the B level. Also. It is possible, right? But there can be a lot of cases where parent or company directly owns say 100 subsidiaries and and each subsidiary then holds two three company two three company like this uh, so if you keep doing basically at, and there is again a possibility that those 100 subsidiaries may have few subsidiaries which are sitting in inclusive framework country and not in inclusive framework country. So what happened in that case? So it's not always possible that you keep going down the line and keep applying IRR because at some stage you might come into a country which is not an inclusive framework company. The parent is uh, not been uh, able to apply IRRs. So you have only other option left is UTPR, which is under tax uh, profit rule, which you are which you are trying to. So where you are creating a new kind of a tax expenses or not tax a new kind of expenses in the book so that the average tax rate of that jurisdiction level country goes up to minimum of 15%. So that's the idea behind UTPR. So now what happens in this case is I company A does not apply uh, IRR, so we go to company B. So company B, what we do is basically we already know 19% is the corporate tax rate in company B. So now you uh, basically put a new kind of expense which which increases uh, your expenses and reduces sorry which reduces your expenses and increases your profit in such a manner that you pay additional 15 percent uh, corporate so look as i said that if say for example now how you do it because how from where you will put uh, this kind of uh, new expenses so one is that you can just enact saying that this is the calculation you have to follow secondly there is a possibility that B company may be making some payments to C company. For example, in this example, say uh, B company has to pay 25 uh, to company C. So what it will say is that let's deduct 15 uh, or say let's deduct 15 out of this payment, which will go uh, against the top of tax under UTPR. So what it happens is that 15 actually from the 25 payment, the 15 directly goes to the tax authorities against a UTTPR. This is an additional tax levied and only 10 then can transfer to C. So what happened by this? Then company B collects that additional 15% through this second method of UTPR. So wherever, wherever you are not able to apply the income inclusion rule, then the other options left for you UTPR. And there can be certain scenarios where you can't apply UTPR also. Then you have the subject to tax or STTR, which I mentioned there, which is which is basically more connected with the tax treaty. So something uh, that needs more uh, understanding and knowledge of the international taxation because and you have to look at the double taxation agree agreements and a lot of different things. So that particular topic will take some time to get mature. Uh, but at the moment, yeah, these two topics are going to come into action and it is already in action around the globe. Right, so now we already discussed about effective tax rate. So now how is this effective tax rate is calculated and what it means? 
So something important you have to understand here is that effective tax rate when you calculate, you calculate at a jurisdiction level, not at the parent level. So the idea behind global minimum tax is not to ensure minimum 15% tax for the entire group. No, not that's not the idea. The idea is that the, the jurisdiction level, the global minimum tax must be at least 15%. So you have to calculate effective, effective tax rate at every jurisdiction level. So how do you do it? You basically take all the profits of the company, so like tax on the uh, uh, basically any, so look at the all the net profit which you have achieved um, during the year, adjust for any, so any kind of, you know, deferred taxes, assets or liabilities um, as per um, IFRS 12, you can apply and, and take into consideration. And then what you get is what called, what is called the global income. So the people who are into IFRS, they understand deferred tax asset and liability. So there are certain, very good logics behind that. So basically those adjustment also you have to do when you look at your global income. So that's what, what it means, a global income. And then you look at the cover taxes. So how you calculate the cover taxes? Cover taxes mean any tax which is paid on the retained earnings or on the corporate equity or on the profit of the company. So you, you total all the taxes, but you have to pay attention. Excise tax, VAT or any other such indirect taxes are not covered. Uh, even uh, you have to pay attention, like for example, excise tax always hits the cost of sale. VAT, VAT is never covered by the company, it's always paid by the customer. So it does not hit the P&L as such. So that's not a big issue, but like for example, excise tax normally hits your P&L. So see, when you're looking at the covered taxes, you don't take these indirect taxes into your calculations. So covered tax means the taxes on the profits. So that's something important you have to understand. So there is backward calculations to be done in order to, in order to calculate the covered taxes. So again, this is uh, the formula which is given um, in the in the consultation document. How do you calculate effective tax? So I thought let's put a slide on this as well. Um, so top of tax in scope M is charge where profit are charged below. So this top of tax uh, uh, through the effective tax rate is calculated for for jurisdiction where the tax rate is below fifteen percent, right? And is import at a constituent entity level at a jurisdiction level. So how do you do it? Is uh, first, you identify a constituent, and so con when you identify a constituent entity, you have to identify at a jurisdiction level. Calculate the globe income as we discussed in the earlier slide. Find out how much tax that constituent entity is paid. So basically, uh, we are talking about covered taxes. So covered taxes means all taxes on the profits, equity, and those nature, but not the indirect taxes, excise, VAT, or such nature, right? So that covered taxes. So you divide your covered taxes divided by globe income and find out the percentage and see if that percentage is 15% or not. If it is below the 15%, there where you know you have this top of tax comes into picture. So for example, in a country where the tax, uh, the effective tax rate comes to 9%, then you apply basically 6% as a top of tax in order to reach to a 15%. This is one of the very a logical reason why UAE has implemented a different tax rate for the multinational enterprise because at some stage, at some stage, that multinational enterprise has to pay the top of tax, whether they pay in UAE or in some other countries. So why not that share should be given to UAE where they are generating those profits? So that's one one of the very logical reasons behind it. So let's look at example here also. As I said, say A is parent company established in UK, owns company B in UA and company C in UK. In this case, effective taxes to be separately calculated for company B and company C. So UA, you have to look at the effective tax rate here and Saudi also the effective rate separately. Now let's look at what is the impact on GCC countries um, based on this pillar two. One is that the, the tax rate in, uh, so the, the impact is low to medium in other GCC, like Saudi, for example, Saudi, Qatar, and all the tax rate is between 15 to 20%. So even, even if you apply the global rules on those countries, uh, on the multinational enterprise, there will not be much impact because they're already either at the global minimum tax or higher higher than that. The major high impact comes in countries with, where uh, the tax rate is below the 15%. So like UAE has 9%, Bahrain has no tax. So there where the major impact uh, will come in those countries. So, so, so countries which are highly impacted, they have two options basically. 
either either to make the tax rate in that country equal to 15% for all the companies or you at least bring multinational uh, company uh, multinational enterprise level corporate tax to minimum 15%. So at least that particular country get a fair share of the tax on the profits which is generated by that multinational enterprise in that country because anyway anyway that that company has to pay global minimum tax at some level at the top of tax level or utpr at some level they will pay why not that tax then should be given to the country where they are generating those economic profit that's the very basic logic behind this um, pillar two Okay, now there are some transitional rules um, as well. Now, as you know, the corporate tax has already um, started um, some time back. Um, it started from 1st of June onwards, 2023. Uh, so we are already in the corporate tax year, but pillar two is not there. So pillar two is most like now we have the consultation document, maybe in a year time or six months time, you will see this rule coming into a full law. Okay, so till that stage, till um, you know uh, that stage, what happens uh, in between? That's what transitional rules is trying to cover. So when you start on the first year, so what do you, how do you how do you get started? Because you are right now, for example, paying nine percent, nine percent. Suddenly you are a part. You say you are a constituent entity, part of a multinational enterprise, and you are just paying nine percent, nine percent. Suddenly you have fifteen percent because now the pillar two is is effective on a particular date now what do you do that that's what it is transitional rules so at that stage what are the main things to look at um one is that uh, the deferred tax as entered liability um, at the starting point you have to calculate that and take it into account that is something mentioned in the transitional rules so this is something you have to pay attention to when you are um, having uh, basically the calculations at the beginning of your transition rule uh, second transitional rule also talks about a higher substance based income inclusion so now again this uh, substance based income inclusion exclusion is, is a very different concept so i'll just talk a very brief about it uh, because this is another topic of one hour which i don't want to uh, put your energies into right now so what it talks about is that we are talking about say effective tax rate of uh, you know 15% uh, or for example uh, effective tax rate of 15 minimum global minimum tax of 15% in a particular country uh, but you know for example Sometimes you see a lot of con. Um, why? Why? First of all, let's go back to why this pillar two has come to picture. One is that the 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 large multinational companies are restructuring their business models into different places across the globe so that their average tax rate goes below. Like we saw, Amazon uh, paying effective tax rate six point one percent. A U.S. incorporate entity with the tax rate is twenty one percent. So how how that happens is why we are restructuring your business across the globe, right? Uh, so now this higher substance based income exclusion um, rule basically talks about is that whenever this con these companies are restructuring their business into different countries, there is always a bit of uh, real investment also in those countries. So for example, they're putting staff, they're putting tangible assets, they're putting employees. So what it is trying to say is that the income on which you will put this global minimum tax has to be reduced by a particular figure which actually relates to the real efforts which are done in those countries. So they have put the people, they have put the resources, the tangible assets. So they, they in order to simplify uh, the, the globe rules talks about a percentage, uh, the average percentage which OECD guidelines talks about is, this actually is basically the replica of OECD guidelines. So uh, the, the average, the rate is between uh, is around 5%. So 5% of the salaries in that particular country and 5% of the uh, tangible um, net worth expense really like a depreciation. Uh, that percentage you reduce from that uh, income on which you will apply the global minimum tax. So so in the transitional rules, that top of the, the, the substance based income exclusion is is topped up from 5 to 10% for payroll and 8% for tangible assets. So again, this is another long topic. Uh, I'll not go into it, but just for your knowledge, what it tries to do is the, the actual uh, what you call resources put into that country, 
that particular we should uh, give uh, you know uh, consideration to the real income which is generated for that country by uh, for that country by that company so so that is what you're trying to exclude this is what it is so it just reduces the the your global income by that percentage so let's leave it there so the percentage increased from 5 to 10 percent the third transitional rule is, is the uh, rule is that multinational groups in their initial phase of international activity are not part of UTPR. So, so basically, um, uh, any entity, any um, any multinational enterprises which are in the initial years of their operation. So, initial year is also very well defined in the PCD. Basically, one of the con condition is that your presence is only in six jurisdictions. So, th those con those companies which are having the presence only in six countries can still. Uh, make use of transitional uh, rules and avoid avoid uh, this UTPR related rules for next five years. So that is an again given in the transitional rule. Uh, so uh, that you can uh, look at it. And the third and the fourth one is filing deadline. Normally the filing deadline in the rules is 15 months from end of the the the, the year. But uh, however, in the first year it is extended to 18 months. So that's another point in the transitional rules. I think we are coming to end of the marathon run. So I have few questions just to see how how far you've been listening and what have you gained out of it. So what I will do is uh, what I will do here is uh, Sanjay, you just leave it here for a few more seconds. Uh, just have to do here is basically uh, I'm putting some questions on on the screen here. Uh, just type out your, your uh, answer in the chat window. Let's see how far you are able to uh, gauge. So a company has more than say you know, 750 million revenue, but no foreign operation. Does it fall under pillar two? What's your answer? Just type it in the chat window. I'll give you say five seconds to put your answer. Sanjay Bhai, you're there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, right. What's your take on this? No, it won't. Okay. So I think we are getting very correct answer that uh, it will not apply because it talks about multinational enterprises and uh, if company has no operation, no foreign operation, even if 750 million or whatever is the size uh, of the operation, it does not fall into pillar two. Correct. The second question. OK, a second. So, so the threshold of euro 750 million checked for current year so when you apply the pillar 2 rules you check the uh, threshold for the current year 750 million or no yes or no if some yeah i'm getting some good right answers yeah very correct i think junaid has put uh, the correct so basically your uh, you'll check it, check it last four years of your revenue and see at least two out of the four years must cross 750 million euros in order to qualify under the global rules. So very correct. Uh, well, so you're paying attention. Brilliant. Loved it. And the last question is, can IRR and UTAPR be both applied? The answer is yes and no. You're right and no, but possible. I think Joseph uh, very much, I think, picked up uh, the point correct. Actually, technically speaking, it creates more confusion uh, because when you have income inclusion rule and you put UTPR at the same time, it, it there is a chance of a higher taxation at some stage. But, you know, the problem comes is when one parent company apply income inclusion rule and another jurisdiction sitting there saying that why should I miss it? Say, for example, in that country, country, the rate of tax is less than 15 percent and they want to tax a little bit, little bit higher and they don't have a separate regulation like UAE has issued a separate regulation altogether. But that country does not have the separate regulation. Now what they do, they can apply a UTPR in order to collect that balance. So there's one option is that you keep, you know, fighting in the international courts to solve, find the answer. But the idea of the globe rules is that 15% minimum tax should be paid and should be paid to the country where the economic benefits are operated. So there is a chance that the IR and UTPR can both apply, but 
the idea is that will not apply and i'll tell you very clearly here that the countries who are going into the inclusive framework they are intelligent they know what it means and how it will benefit those countries so there is a very low chance that they will miss out uh, this 15% um, so uh, but there is a chance of higher utp at the same but it become more complex go can chances of international disputes so uh, but it it may happen so very right thank you so much uh, thank you so much for your participation loved it i think my effort has has been useful so far thank you right i think we are at the end of the session um uh, sanjay we do we have any question please write down any question you want to just hear out uh, hear us out we have some time i think we have received one question from mr junaid which i already replied in the chat box i regarding the timelines uh, after that, I have not seen any further question about timeline. I hope the presentation was very much clear. Uh, if any further questions, please post it. Shikha has asked one question. Let's me, let me read that out. Uh, in the meantime, if you still have to ask any question, please you know, drop that question here. A UA company having 100% subsidiary in 100 another tax country, but subsidiary is a wrap office and consolidated revenue in UAE exceeds, exceeds minimum threshold as per pillar two. Will UAE can be taxed at 15%? So now in this case, what you have to see is the wrap office normally does not generate any revenue. Uh, so wrap office is a representative office. The idea is to keep relationship with the clients in this that particular country. Normally there is no revenue in a wrap office. So I don't think you will have an issue there. But uh, in terms of jurisdiction, it becomes a multinational enterprise, definitely. So, so the pillar two can apply in that country, but again, in the in in the in transitional rule, um, like the the early stage multinationals, up to six jurisdictions, uh, they are giving that that liberty to avoid being part of the pillar two. So there is one advantage there, but overall, uh, as I said, uh, that profit generally does not have a income as such. So. Uh, then consolidated revenue most likely will be of UA only. So, so what will happen is a rep, rep office normally function is um, create relationship with the clients, but the actual billing happens from the parent, from where the country company is sitting. So UA most likely will be sending the inverses across. So, so yes, minimum tax then applies in that case. So Luis has a question. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, before that, uh, Shika, I hope I've answered your question. If you still have further, please feel free to drop a message. Um, so Luis is asking, I'm having issues registering our entities for corporate tax on the Imara tax portal. It requires it requests details of shareholding more than 25%. Our shareholders are all non-UA companies, but the registration application has a mandatory field for UA-based trade license. Uh, license authority, which is not applicable in our case. Do you know what's the solution for this is, Sanjay? Uh, That's I, think, yeah, that's, uh, I think our tax team will get in touch with you to understand who are the shareholders, what are the nationalities, and uh, to see the, what a technical glitch you're getting it. So if you can just drop your email address and contact detail, uh, our technical team will uh, I mean, call you and understand it, MR tax portal. Normally, you should not face any issue there. Right. And also, Luis, there is a basically guidance paper issued on the registration, which which uh, answers some of the exception. But we should also, um, uh, you know, realize that in the early stage, normally when the Mara portal uh, is still are getting up new um, new uh, options, which were not like in their knowledge earlier. Uh, so uh, there's a chance that something like this is not there, which which they are going to up, up, uh, update. But at the same time, there's a chance that there is a, another way to put that information across, which you might not be getting the right window. I think the best would be the people who are actually doing the registration. So we have our team, I think, daily basis. They are doing tens of registration. So drop an email and we're happy to help there, right? Uh, thank you, Shika, for your message. I think there are no more further questions, and it's a working day. So I think let's end the session right now. And if any questions are left unanswered, we are we are just an email away or a phone call away. And thank you very much, and have a brilliant day. Thank you very much. Enjoy, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take bye. care. Bye. Thank you.